Hi folks, this is Brian at Hobby Link Japan and this is another exciting episode of Boss Builds. Uh, now I'm not the Hobby Link Japan's boss, that's of course President Scott Harge, who you've seen in uh, other Boss Builds, uh, but I am the site manager of the English uh, website that you see, uh, hobbylink.com. Uh, I'm the boss of that, and I'm the boss of these guys, Luke and uh, Ryan here, and some other fine folks who put the, all the magic together on .com. Now in this episode of Boss Builds, I'm going to be building the JGSDF Type 10 Main Battle Tank. This is an excellent little kit uh, that Fujimi has just released. Um, obviously it's a, a tank as you see here, and this is the latest tank of the Japan Self-Defense Forces. The actual tank itself isn't even uh, in service yet, uh, but we do have the kit and it should be a fun little build. Oh! <laughs> keep that, keep that, don't cut that out. Um, so yeah, the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force, that's JGSDF, that's the Rikujo Jietai, for those of you who are studying Japanese out there. Uh, ground Self-Defense Forces, and this is the Type 10 main battle tank. So Type 10, what does is, what is the 10 mean? Uh, well, it was um, adopted as the new main battle tank in the year 2010. So all the Japanese tanks since uh, uh, after the war uh, always used types. Type 61, Type 74, Type 90, and, the, and uh, now this one's the Type 10. Um, it hasn't actually entered service yet, uh, that'll be sometime this year, but as I mentioned before, we do have the kit. And uh, let's take a look at some of the other uh, Japan Self-Defense Force tank kits that are available, uh, and also look at the, some of the history of tanks uh, in post-war Japan. Uh, so we'll get back to this kit later and show you what's inside. Now after the war, of course, uh, Japan's army was um, disbanded, there was no army, um, but as things stabilized and the country was rebuilt, of course they needed to have some sort of armed forces, uh, and it was never again called army because that uh, sounds a little too aggressive, it was always called the self-defense force because it was uh, ostensibly set up just to defend Japan uh, from any outside aggression. Um, and of course after the war, uh, Japan was banned from um, developing any of its own weapons, uh, per se. So what they got after the Korean War was some tanks from uh, the U.S. after the Korean War. And one of those tanks was the, the old Venerable Sherman. This is the M4A3 E8 uh, Sherman with the Easy 8 suspension. Uh, now this is an excellent, excellent kit from Tasca that maybe we can build uh, somewhere down the road. I actually bought this kit myself because I'm, I'm a GA Type fan. But this is an excellent kit. And uh, this was a good tank for its time. Uh, you'll see this in a lot of Godzilla movies. You often see these going up uh, haplessly against uh, the giant monsters and getting their butts kicked, but uh, it was a good tank for its time. Now, they also used, uh, from the States, we don't have some kits here, but they used the M24 Chaffee and uh, the M4 Walker Bulldog. And these are all surplus vehicles that uh, Japan purchased from the United States. Now, in 1961, let me dig out the right kit here. We got two versions of that. Uh, Japan developed its first domestically developed tank after the war, and this was the Type 61 main battle tank. Type 61, again, 61 means it was adopted for service in 1961. Um, it was a little behind its time, even when it came out, uh, it had a 90 millimeter main gun um, and some very, uh, not very thick armor, so it was not the best tank at its time, but it was what the self-defense forces needed at the time. Uh, you'll see these in a lot of Godzilla movies too. So the Type 61. Now following up on that, also getting back to this, if you're familiar with the uh, US M47 tank, at the time Japan was considering buying the M47, uh, but they decided to go ahead and develop their own, the Type 61, uh, but you can see the influence that the M47 uh, had on this design here. So I'll put these guys over here. Now next up is my favorite Japanese tank, and that's the Type 74. Uh, again, Type 74 was adopted for service in 1974. Uh, this was an interesting design. It was kind of more influenced by some of the Soviet tanks, T-55, T-62s like that. It's got no return rollers, so it had, uh, you know, this loose-fitting, uh, sagging track, uh, kind of a flattened, uh, rounded cast turret similar to the T-62. Um, ah, so it's a very interesting. I just like the look of this tank. It's, uh, it's quite cool, and you'll see this in a few Godzilla movies too. Um, now, with this design, they started uh, implementing what's called the active suspension system. And that means that the suspension, um, with uh, I'm not sure if it's hydraulic or what kind of pressure they used or systems they used, but uh, it, it could raise the whole hull, it could tilt to one side, tilt to the other, backwards and forwards. Uh, the reason for that is, is, is um, you know, to get the gun, to lay the gun on target uh, more easily. You can come up on a hill, whatever, jack the suspension up, and you can have more of a, a straight line of sight with the turret. 
uh, and also for you know uh, going over more crazy terrain and stuff like that. So with the Type 74, they started using that suspension. Uh, so this is a great little kit. This is from Pit Road, and it's in 172nd scale, which is the same scale as the Type 10 that we'll be building later. And uh, this is an excellent kit. There's also another kit by Fujimi themselves. Back when they were doing 176th scale, 76, 176, a little smaller than the 72nd, so it won't really match up uh, scale-wise with the new kit. Uh, but this is an excellent kit, too. Um, oh, one of the differences, we can just talk about the kits, for instance. This one has flexible vinyl belt style tracks, uh, which are okay, nicely detailed, but it's kind of hard to get this good sag here. Uh, what I really like about the, um, the, I don't have it here, but the Fujimi kit and this kit here, actually, is uh, their injection molded link and length tracks. So this sag, which you can see here a bit on the Type 61 as well, but uh, particularly on the Type 74, uh, it's got a really nice sag molded in. Now, uh, Fujimi also makes a Type 74 tank in 176 scale, but we didn't have that one in stock right now, so I can't show you that. So, the Type 74. Uh, this one's from Pit Road. There's also one from Fujimi. Now, moving on to the most modern before the Type 10 tank is the Type 90. Uh, main battle tank, which was again entered service or was adopted for service in 1990. Uh, this is a third generation main battle tank uh, on par with the US's M1 Abrams, uh, Germany's Leopard series of tanks. Um, uh, yeah, like that. So it was, uh, it has the standard 120 millimeter smoothbore cannon, fires all standard NATO rounds. Uh, so up until now, this was uh, on par with any, any main battle tank in the world, it could hold its own. Um, and if you're familiar with the German Leopard tank, you can see that uh, this was heavily influenced uh, by the Leopard 2 design. Uh, the, when I first saw this tank uh, published in some magazines, I thought, what, Japan is buying Leopards? Uh, no, they just borrowed heavily from the Leopard design. Uh, even the, the gun is a license-built uh, Japanese gun, uh, licensed by Rheinmetall of uh, Germany. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of lineage going back to the German tanks there. Uh, this is another Fujimi kit, again in 176th scale, so it won't match up with the 172nd scale of this kit, but it's a great, uh, greatly detailed kit. Uh, Pit Road also makes the Type 90 in 172nd scale. Uh, we didn't have any in stock right now, so I can't show you that. But these are all great small scale kits. Now going to show you one more larger scale kit in 135th. By the way, this, was, this Sherman was 135th back here. The Tamiya, this is an excellent kit, Tamiya Type 90. Uh, came out uh, quite a while ago, but it, it, uh, it's an excellent tooling, uh, excellent detail. This particular version of the kit comes with an ammunition loading crew. Um, so the, yeah, this is a great set. Tommy also makes one with the big uh, mine roller attachment that goes on to the front. Uh, we didn't have that one in stock right now, so I couldn't show you that. But uh, yeah, the Type 90. Now, up until now, the Type 90 has been Japan's main battle tank, but there was one problem with it. It's too big. It's too big for the roads and bridges of uh, the main island Honshu of Japan. Uh, so there are a few of them stationed at uh, the Fuji Armor School, where they practice using tanks, obviously. Uh, and uh, the bulk of them, or actually all the other ones, are in Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island of Japan. It's, uh, it's got wide expanses, wider roads. Uh, they can actually use them there. So uh, for a long time, there was always the, the problem of, well, something happened and we needed to deploy these to the mainland of Japan, what are you going to do? Well, you're going you're gonna to ruin a lot of roads and destroy a lot of bridges. Uh, so that's why we have the Type 10 now. Uh, just to compare the, the two latest tanks, uh, the Type 90 was a, you know, a world-class tank and world-class size as well. It's a 50-ton tank. It's up, you know, up there with the Abrams and the Leopard. Uh, so what Japan has done with the Type 10 is downsized. It's got the same gun, slightly different, but it's still the, the L44 120mm uh, smoothbore gun uh, that's upgradable, they say, to L55, which just means the barrel will be a bit longer, get higher velocity, uh, greater range. Uh, but this tank is uh, a lot lighter. This tank uh, at full battle weight is supposed to be only 44 tons, and uh, physically, dimensionally, it's a lot smaller, so it'll fit on roads. Uh, and it'll fit on, it won't knock down bridges when it goes across it. Although, you know, between, it's only six tons difference, but apparently that six tons means a lot. Uh, and of course, um, this being a, it's not only a, the fourth generation tank built in Japan, it, it's a, what's called a fourth generation main battle tank. That means it uh, incorporates all sorts of uh, electronic systems, uh, internet-based things, uh, all the modern technology that's available on the modern battlefield uh, to get the job done. And this tank has it. 
Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with other main battle tank, fourth generation ones such as, well, what is the other one? The Leclerc, the French Leclerc tank. Uh, kind of looks like the Leclerc, doesn't it? Well, that's because they've adopted a modular armor system. Um, all this stuff on the side here uh, can be removed. And uh, they will also have like different packages for different missions. If they're going to be like uh, in city fighting or whatever, they can add on some different armor. If it's going to be out in the desert or wherever, uh, they can choose different uh, armor packages to put on the tank, uh, the sides of the fronts too, uh, which just seems to be the way a lot of countries are going. The British Challenger 2 also can have a lot of different packages put on there. Um, but with the main thing keeping the weight down, so even with all those different things, it's still not supposed to go over 44 tons. Uh, so that is a quick history of uh, the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force tanks uh, and some of the kits we have uh, for sale here. Uh, at Hobby Link Japan. There's also some other GA type vehicles such as Tamiya's light armored vehicle which is kind of a Jeep type thing. Uh, I didn't bring those here because I just wanted to talk about tanks. Um, there's the Pit Road Trumpeter collaborations of some of the Type 96 APCs, armored personnel carriers, uh, some of the scout vehicles. So we do have a pretty good selection of uh, GA type vehicles here at HLJ. Now one more quick item I'll show you just before we get into this uh, is reference material. This is a brand new tank, there's not much out on it. Uh, if you go on the internet you can find some pictures. Not a lot of literature though. Uh, so, but we actually have this, so I picked this up to help me with the build. It's got um, a lot of great shots of the uh, three prototype tanks. And by the way, this kit builds into the third prototype vehicle. We'll talk more about those details later. Uh, but this is a great book. A lot of shots, a lot of close-up shots, reference shots, uh, so you can figure out what you want to paint, how you want to paint it, uh, other little details that might not be included on the kit that you want to put on there. And it also comes with a DVD. I think this is region free, so it should play in most DVD players around the world. I actually sat down and watched this last night. It's got a lot of great shots of this thing uh, being put through its paces. Actually, two of them at one time, uh, driving around like crazy uh, at the Fuji Tank School thing. And these things just go like crazy. They, uh, I think the top speed is 70 kilometers an hour and interestingly enough that's forward and backward because you want to get out of trouble as quickly as you can get into it. Uh, so anyway, history of the GA tie, some talk about some of these kits. Uh, now let's check out what's inside the box. Now I've of course already checked this out myself and this is a gem of a little kit. Uh, it's 172nd scale which is rather small as you can see here's the hull here and the turret which is a very big turret. Um, but yeah it should be a fun kit. Now now, I've been modeling my whole life, just about. Ever since I was a wee lad, probably since about seven or eight, when Dad got tired of building the models for me, I took over and started building them myself. So I've been building for a long time. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I'm some master modeler or some magician with styrene and knives and all that that can whip up these incredible creations, but I can usually get the results I want with the tools that I have. Um, build all kinds of stuff, science fiction, cars, uh, airplanes, monsters, all that kind of stuff. Dabbled in some ships for a little bit, but I never really got into ships. But if I had to say what kind of modeler am I, and people ask me that, I'll just say armor. I build armor. If I look at my shelves, what have I actually completed? Mostly armor stuff. Uh, now within armor, I generally do 135th scale or larger. I like the 124th and even the 116th scale stuff because, you know, big guy, big hands, getting old, the eyes aren't so great anymore. So it's uh, kind of easier working with the bigger kits. But I've built a few 172nd scale kits. Uh, some of the older Fujimi kits, um, their previous Tiger and uh, Stalin tanks were excellent. Uh, and I also built uh, the Type 74 from Fujimi and that's an excellent little kit. Uh, so even with these big hands, you can still put together an excellent little model from these great kits. Uh, now let's have a look and see what's inside here. Um, don't need to really open up all the bags if you can see this. I don't know if there's any glare on this. This is the turret. It's, uh, they use a lot of slide molding uh, when they're making this kit. So you've got detail not only on the top but also on the sides. And uh, essentially a one piece thing here. We'll put the bottom on there and it'll be complete. So there we got the big turret. Um, this is the lower hull and the the running gear is uh, already molded in there, which is nice because that would be a lot of little tiny fiddly parts, which this kit already has plenty of. Um, now, an inch, a quick thing to say about this particular tank, if you see the box art again, notice the sides. It's got these huge side skirts, uh, armored side skirts, and below that these rubber sand skirts, um, which are always in place. You'll never see these tanks without that in place unless they're doing maintenance. Um, but what this effectively does is cover up most of the tracks and running gear, which is kind of a good thing because then you don't have to worry about uh, getting too crazy with painting all that, particularly the top run of the tracks and all that. Um, 
Now there's one particular point of detail here that uh, I'm not sure about. That there's no return rollers with the kit. And I haven't seen enough photographs of the tank to see if there are any return rollers uh, on the real tank, but just looking how it, how it moves on that DVD and seeing photos of it, I'm almost sure there are. Uh, but uh, they've either foregone them in this kit or, or forgot about them or just decided, like me, that you don't need the detail up there because you're never ever going to see it. Uh, so that's the lower hull. Now for these little kits uh, like Fujimi and, well, the, the, the pit road kits use uh, vinyl tracks. One of the great things about these kits is they have excellent, excellent injection molded, uh, usually link and length tracks, but looking at these tracks, these are length and length. Uh, each, each run of track on each side is four pieces. You've got like the straight top part, which you can see here. Um, you've got the lower run, which actually comes off the road wheel and moves up to the, the drive wheel and the idler wheel. That's already built in there. Uh, excellent detail on both sides. And I was checking out the instructions in here. These have really good uh, positive locators that the tracks glue into the, uh, the drive sprocket, uh, the drive wheel, and the idler wheel. Uh, so it's, it's just looking at it. I haven't put it together yet, so I'll tell you more about that later. But looking at how the construction of it looks like it's going to be pretty foolproof to get the tracks on perfectly. Um, now another particularly interesting detail about this kit uh, and these tanks in general is, if I can show you this, you can see here the tracks. Uh, there are no rubber pads on them. These are like the the, the battle battle ready tracks. Uh, no rubber pads on there, uh, but they're usually not in battle that often. So uh, to ride on uh, regular streets without tearing up the streets, they often have rubber pads on the tracks. Now what Fujimi has done here is they've molded the tracks as the regular steel tracks with no pads, and then get, get a load of this. They give you individual track pads. Uh, that you can put on each track link uh, to model it with the track pads on. Uh, now to date, I haven't seen any reference photos with the rubber pads on there, but of course when it's in service and uh, you know, driving down local streets around the base, uh, they're going to have to have the pads on. Um, now these little things are crazy. This uh, looks to be a fairly easy to put together kit and with the link, uh, well, sorry, with the length and length tracks, the track should be easy too. Uh, but if there's any uh, particularly tedious part of building this kit, it would be putting uh, these little guys on here. Uh, I've already decided I'm not going to do that because uh, I'm what you call a lazy modeler. I like to do the least amount of work to get the, the, the greatest effect. And um, for me, I prefer it uh, with the standard steel battle tracks, uh, not the padded tracks. So, now another thing interesting, since we're on this subject here, is the instructions Say so if you're going to use these, they, they give you enough to put on the entire run of track on each side. Um, which I think is absolutely crazy, because as we mentioned before, you're only going to see... Now if you put these pads on, here we go back to this photo, you'll only see this, the front portions of the track and the rear portions. You'd probably want to put them on the bottom too, because it would change the, the, the height of the tracks. Uh, but yeah, they suggest you put it all the way on the top, which you will never see. So even if I did decide to use the track pads, um, I would certainly not put them on the top. Uh, although there are those modelers out there who say, well, I, I know it's there. I will know it's there, so it does my heart good. Uh, and if you're that kind of modeler, that's fine. Whatever you want to do. But uh, if I was doing it, uh -uh, wouldn't put all these on. Moving on to some other parts here. Here's a, a runner or a sprue of uh, some tiny fiddly bits. Uh, one good feature of this kit is they give you the, the bustle basket. That's like the little storage rack on the back of the turret. Um, is nicely molded uh, in, it's only what, four parts here? Um, but uh, nice, fairly in scale uh, bars there. Uh, one of the downfalls of the Fujimi Type 90 kit, and I won't bother opening it up, I'll just tell you about it, is the, the bustle on the back there was molded solid. So you lose kind of the, the, the scale effect on that one. Um, that's really the only downfall of that kit. But for this kit, uh, they decided to go ahead and mold it in very finely molded uh, parts here. Uh, which of course means you have to be very careful with them, or you'll break them. Uh, again, you see the bottom of the turret here. Um, going back to the slide mold technology aspect of the kit here, the main barrel, the 120 millimeter gun, um, slide molded so that the, the barrel is open, the muzzle, the muzzle is open there, as it would be. Uh, I think for most of these other kits you actually have to drill out the barrel. Uh, for the smaller kits, of course, the, the bigger kits are open. Um, and crazily enough, even the, the 50 caliber gun that's mounted on the turret also has an open muzzle brake, which would be very, very difficult to do uh, by yourself with a pin vise in this scale or a small drill. Uh, all the hatches are positionable. You can have them open or closed. Um, 
looking at the kit and when I do this when I open up a kit and I know most modelers do the same thing you're, you're going through the parts and you think well what am I gonna do what am I gonna do with this looking at these parts do I need to change something on this am I gonna leave it as it is uh, and going through this kit uh, in that frame of mind the only thing I see that I'm going to change or add uh, are these antenna parts as you can see here, they're a little short and a little stubby um, and a little overscale in, uh, in styrene, but that's just one of the limitations of uh, molding plastic parts kits, particularly in a, a kit of this small scale. Um, so when we get to this part, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to snip those off and uh, substitute them with some uh, 0.3 or maybe even 0.2 millimeter uh, brass rods, brass wire, uh, that'll have a much more realistic effect. And they're much longer. These are much too short for the real tanks, but uh, you know, Fujimi gave us something to work with here. Uh, the last bit of parts we have here is the upper hull. I'll give you an idea of what the final size of the thing is going to be. Uh, and the, the all-inclusive rubber and armored side skirts here, which will cover up uh, most of the road wheels and the tracks, which will save us a lot of work with those. Um, also some very tiny, these are going to be hard to cut off. Uh, light guards and uh, the little weather wind sensor guard that goes on the back of the turret and the tow cable which looking at this this is going to be uh, gonna have to be very careful cutting this out because it is extremely thin uh, extremely detailed uh, perfectly in scale uh, for the size of the tank um, got, but you know again with these big hands it's going to be a bit of a challenge to get the part off without uh, snapping it so there we go that's the parts uh, the instructions like most Fujimi instructions, uh, mostly in Japanese, but when you get down to the construction, I mean, there's little or no language at all. So it's uh, very well illustrated, as we were talking about before. Here are the tracks, which, uh, you know, for a kit like this, uh, that was going to be one of the things I wanted to showcase in the build, was uh, showing how to put these tracks together. I was hoping it was link and length, because the, the, the link and length links are a little trickier to put together, but this looks like it's going to be very simple. Uh, so it shouldn't be a problem at all. And I like the way they've designed it to put on and the way they've set it. Do you essentially put the tracks together with the idler and the sprocket, uh, and then it's just like, that's it by itself, and you can put it on there. So if you wanted to go crazy and completely detail paint the insides, uh, the road wheels and all that, uh, you could do that. Um, different philosophies for armor modelers when uh, they're talking about road wheels or, or assembly in general. Uh, and we're going to we're going to airbrush this one later. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty simple as you can see here. It's just a two tone, um, an army green and an army brown. Oops, we don't say army. Sorry, self defense force green and self defense force brown colors. Um, I'm still deciding whether I'm going to try to freehand it uh, or try some masks with it. Uh, looking at the real tanks on the DVD, it uh, up close it's a hard edged camo. But when you see it from a distance, which in this scale, you know, unless you've got your eyeball on it, it's going to be like from a distance, uh, it looks kind of faded. And the tanks in general are, are rather dusty themselves, so I might just try freehanding it. We'll see. Um, like anything in modeling, there are no mistakes. There are only opportunities. So if I try free, freehanding it and it's not working out, I'll just try it again and uh, try some masks. Uh, so yeah, I'll break out my trusty airbrush and we'll try that. And what was I talking about before this? The tracks? Oh, with the painting in the tracks and how to do it. Um, in the old days, I would put together a tank kit and I would paint all the road wheels and paint the tracks separately and get it all together and paint the, the body separately and get it all together uh, as a final assembly. Um, but talking with some of, the, some of the excellent modelers we have here in Japan, like uh, uh, Mr. Doi from Armor Modeling uh, and some of the guys there, they put the whole thing together from start to finish, boom, without painting anything. And then they do it all from there. And I always thought, well, that's pretty tricky to get the road wheels and all that painted there. Um, and then they told me, and it sounds pretty obvious, if you're going to do any sort of weathering at all on these tanks, uh, which pretty much any tank that's been driven anywhere for more than five minutes is going to have some kind of weathering on it, uh, it doesn't have to be that precise. Uh, particularly if you're using an airbrush, you can get some uh, soft edges in there and um, with other techniques, which we'll, we'll do, uh, you can get a very, very realistic and effective result um, when everything's put together. So what, we'll, what I'll probably do is just build the whole kit uh, and then primer the whole thing. And I've gotten into primering everything in black these days because uh, it really helps make, uh, you can get a lot of good highlights and shadows 
uh, effects going on um, with the final painting. So we'll build the whole kit, uh, primer the whole thing in black, uh, and then I'll start applying the camo colors and then uh, show you how to do, show you how I do uh, the detail work with an airbrush on the tracks uh, and the road wheels. And then um, we'll do some light weathering. Uh, again, these are test tanks and the tanks are always dirty no matter how they are, uh, but I'm not going to slop it up too much with mud or anything like that. Um, I like my tanks to be slightly dusty, um, slightly used, but uh, not completely, you know, not like they've been bogging all weekend or anything like that. Some people love to do that. And we have decals. Uh, now, Fujimi has uh, happily provided, um, of course, decals for the, the existing three prototypes, which this one builds into the third prototype vehicle. Usually has a bulldozer blade on it. The kit does not include a bulldozer blade, but it does have the, the closer together headlights. Um, but Fujimi has provided the insignias for all the tank battalions in Japan. So you can do, uh, well, they're not going to be what if very soon, but right now they're what if. You can make them for any ba tank battalion uh, around Japan. And uh, so these uh, Fujimi water slide decals are usually very easy to apply, and uh, that'll be one of the things we show later on in the build. So that's the GA tie, that's the kit, and we will see you next time when we actually start digging in.